first you need to listen to everybody and see how things are done. Can you imagine a lawyer telling himself to sit there and be quiet for six months? <laughs> and even if they've done as much homework as they possibly can, it's probably impossible. This is In the Know with ACCT, the voice of community college leaders. I'm Jacob Bray. On this episode of In the Know, we interviewed Jeff Advocate, trustee at the County College of Morris, New Jersey. Jeff was in town for the most recent Governance Leadership Institute, so we talked to him about what trustees need to know and how they can plan for a fulfilling trustee experience. Jeff is a funny guy and had a lot of valuable insight to share. I think you'll enjoy this one. Jeff, before we, uh, before we jump into things, could you give us a little background? I, uh, I'm on the, uh, currently on the Board of Trustees at uh, what we call CCM, which stands for the County College of Morris, which is in Morris County, New Jersey. And uh, just real quick, New Jersey has 21 counties, 19 have uh, county colleges. That's our county college system in the state. And uh, obviously CCM is the college for Morris County. Um, I've been on the board for over 16 years. And uh, real quickly, let me tell you how that happened, um, which I'm kind of proud of, to be honest with you. We have a board of 10 members. Seven are appointed by, by, by the way, New Jersey does an appointment system. About half the country are appointed trustees and about half are elected trustees. New Jersey's are appointed. The way they're appointed is out of the 10 on the board, seven are appointed by our county administrators, which are called freeholders, and two of them are on the board are appointed by the governor's office. Um, and uh, the one remaining position is what we call the county superintendent of the schools. By statute, the county superintendent of the schools automatically has a seat on each of the uh, trustee boards. So I, was, I, am one, I am one of the two governor appointments, which quite frankly I'm a little bit proud of because I've been there for over 16 years. Each appointment is four years, so I've been there through basically four governor positions already, so I'm kind of proud about that, both Democrat and Republican, by the way. But I've been there for over 16 years, and uh, I think it's a, a great responsibility. Uh, obviously, I think our college is doing real well. Before I was appointed, um, I was politically active and uh, active in other ways through the county. I used to be a county prosecutor. Um, I uh, have lived in the county my whole life. Uh, I ran for office, was unsuccessful, but uh, you get to know the county even better that way. And so eventually, because of your community service and your active uh, work, you eventually get someone uh, to uh, think that you have something to offer for the college, and that's how I got appointed. So how much should a new trustee understand about the board process before, they're, before they actually get there? Okay, well, the easy answer is to say as much as possible, but, but let me tell you about that. Um, when I first started my first year, I'll never forget that I didn't know much about the board and how to be a board member. And what I decided to do, which is contrary to what I normally do, I decided to shut up for the first six months and just sit there and listen and soak it in. How does this work? What do you say? What do you not say? When do you talk? When do you not talk? And I just sat there and I listened for the first six months. And uh, I think that's a, a good rule of thumb for any new trustee. First, you need to listen to everybody and see how things are done. Second of all, there's tons of brochures, uh, and this is not a plug for the ACCT, but the ACCT has a tremendous amount of information for new trustees. But also you can, you can locate things on, on the Internet, some of which you got to locate and throw out because they're garbage. Some of, this, some of them, however, are, are good items on the, on the internet about what it means to be a, a county college trustee. And third of all, I spoke to other trustees. Talk to them. They're your friends. You know, when you are on a board of trustees, uh, it, it's a group that supposedly all work together and are all your friends, uh, and you're their friend, and so you learn from them right off the bat. You know, I would have one-on-one uh, -on -one meetings. How, you know, tell me how this functions. How does this work? How, how, what do the committees do? Uh, what are the procedures? What, what, uh, tell me about voting, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Probably the number one person to go to in that regard would be the chair of the trustee board. Uh, the chair, him or her, part of their job is to make sure new trustees know what they're doing. So I would go to that person. And I'll tell you something else that our board does, which I think is a good idea. Whenever a brand new trustee begins on our board, the chair 
couples them up with what we call a mentor, meaning one of the trustees that have been on the board for a longer period of time. And they are always there to guide the new trustee, you know, not, not tell them uh, how to vote. So they're supposed to vote on their own independently. But tell them, you know, answer questions whenever the new trustee has a question. You know, what does this mean? Who is this person? Uh, does this vice president handle that type of situation? And, and the, the trustee mentor is always a, a good person you can rely on as, as, as a close friend who has the experience. So those are all the thoughts I would have as far as how a new trustee begins to be a new trustee and, and kind of jump into it. You know, you're not a real good trustee day one probably, but if, you, if you're quiet and listen and read and learn and ask questions slowly, you'll become a good trustee within the first year. Do you think most people who become trustees are already familiar with the college and how it functions and their, you know, what what's going on at the college prior to the uh, beginning um, of their trusteeship? I would say in my experience, that's not true. Okay. Um, and um, it's probably a good idea if you familiarize yourself with the college as much as you can, to be honest. But I don't, in my experience, I don't think that uh, many new trustees do that. Um, but your first year, you really ought to do that. You know, I mean, walk around the campus, talk to the president. Uh, uh, ask lots of questions, uh, uh, um, download lots of information, get as much information as you can, and learn about the school. You know, there's always statisticals. You know, we're into, we're into the age of stati st statistics and data, uh, which is important. And, um, and uh, the thing is that when, when you do that, I think that it's important to educate yourself about the school. But in my experience, to answer your question, I don't think that most new trustees are 100% knowledgeable about the school before they actually start on, on day one. Um, so you said for you, uh, mm -hmm. six months felt pretty comfortable to sit and absorb the information. Can you, can you imagine, by the way, I've been a lawyer for almost 40 years. Can you imagine a lawyer telling himself to sit there and be quiet for six months? <laughs> <laughs> it was one of the hardest things I had to do. But you know what? It was the best, one of the best things I had to do. Because when you start opening your mouth, you start speaking with intelligence. Mm -hmm. So you know, rather than open your mouth day one, uh, you might say something or do something stupid. Yeah. Um, you know, it's always good to avoid things that are stupid. So, um, so uh, be quiet in the beginning and, and, and like a sponge. Be a sponge for yeah. a while. So al along those same lines, um, as you were presenting to our Governance Leadership Institute for New Trustees, uh, the, the six-month window I found interesting, too, because another point that came up was voting, um, particularly as a new trustee who may not feel or be very well informed about the issue that's up for a vote. And in some cases, um, I think you gave the advice of abstaining, which is another uh, an another way to be quiet and take in information without necessarily giving out. 100% right. Here's, here's what I would elaborate on that. The, there are times when we have a new trustee and uh, the new trustee's first meeting where they're asked to vote on some resolution, um, even if they've read as much as they possibly can about that resolution, and even if they've done as much homework as they possibly can, it's probably impossible to know clearly what's the right way to vote on that resolution as much as co trustees who have been there for 10 years, for instance. Because a lot of these uh, uh, issues that, deal, that, that the college has to deal with are issues that we've been floating around and, and, and going back and forth with, with and discussing and debating for many issues, uh, many years. And uh, probably the brand new trustee may not know it as thoroughly. Um, so, so you get a couple of abstentions from the first couple of meetings from a new trustee, only because you know, they may say something like, you know, with all due respect to the board, I don't feel 100% comfortable uh, making a final decision on that issue, yet I'm in the process of learning. Right At this point, I'd like to abstain. There's nothing wrong with doing that. It's probably the appropriate thing to do. Now, I, I shouldn't say drag your feet and don't learn about what's going on. You, sh you, know, you should gather up as much information as you can, and, and there is a lot of reading to do. But probably in the very beginning, it's n not improper to use the abstention vote. That's what it's there for. Uh, if you can't make a great decision or if you have a conflict of some sort or, or, or many other reasons, abstaining is a, is a very valuable tool that you can use. And hopefully you don't use it every single time. In fact, you should use it sparingly, but it's there for your availability. There may be a benefit to a new trustee coming in with a new perspective, a, uh, an, 
somewhat uninformed perspective of how the board operates and what has been going on. Uh, and they can bring in questions that maybe the board isn't considering. So how, do, how does a new person temper uh, all of their their questions that they, you know, they they really want to find out what's going on versus actually contributing through those questions and prompting the board to think another layer beyond how they're already thinking. On on our board and probably on every board, there are members that have been there a long time, there are members that have been there a short time, and there are members that are brand new. And all three types are valuable. Now let's talk about a new board member. The reason why a new board member is valuable is, 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 is threefold, at least. One, they're there because they have some type of new, important background or capability that the board doesn't have yet. That's why the new trustee was appointed. That's valuable. We have, for instance, one of the areas that boards always deal with is called lands and buildings. You know, when and how do you build a new building for such and such department, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We got a brand new trustee who's a contractor in the county. Who could possibly be more valuable than a brand new trustee who's a contractor? Okay. So once in a while, the board ought to be quiet and listen to that new trustee once in a while. So number one, you Many times the new trustee brings to the board new information that we don't have. Number two, they might bring a brand new idea. Guess what? Older trustees know, quote, know everything, but they don't know everything. They don't know everything that's brand new. And frequently the new trustee is there because they will be able to bring in a brand new idea. And third, the, the new trustee also is going to bring in new blood. Meaning, sometimes, to be frank, older trustees, you know, they may not go to every single function. They may not attend every single committee meeting. You know, why? Because, you know, hey, I've been there before. I know this. I know that. I know what I'm doing, et cetera, et cetera, which, by the way, is not a good way to handle it, but that's, that's the reality. A new trustee is probably less likely to do that. A new trustee is going to be real eager and hungry and valuable uh, with their attendance and their interest and, 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 and bring in a new uh, uh, uh constituency. So, so, so I happen to be uh, an older trustee, by the way, older in the sense that I've been on a board a long time. Of course, I'm not that old. Um, but, um, but, and I think that older trustees have, have value also, but a new trustee absolutely has its own set of value. And uh, uh, I think that's important to recognize. That's why you're there. Um, so what should a new trustee understand about the board chair's role? versus their other board members. Okay. B a board chair is equal to other board members in most senses. Their vote is equal. Their comments are equal. Um, their uh, uh, conscientious work is as equal as anybody else's conscientious work. But the chair has additional responsibilities that are different than all the other members of the board. And what you need to know is, if a problem develops, talk to your chair. If you have a major question in your head, talk to the chair. If you want to get something to administration, but you don't want to administrate, talk to the chair. That, by the way, that last one is very critical because you don't want to violate the Board of Trustees' responsibility, which is to make policy but not administrate the policy. But if you have thoughts, if you have some help, if you have a question, you're, the board's first person and most important person to go to is the board chair. And um, that is why they're there. Now, the board also, the board chair does other things also, like runs the meetings and, and communicates directly with the president frequently. Also, by the way, each individual board member, whether you're new or not new, should never talk to the public independently because you don't speak for the board. But talk to the chair. The chair then speaks to the public. The chair talks to the media. The, the board is a multi-person group, and, but you wor and you work as one large group, as a board does, but you have to speak with one voice. And the best and only way really to speak with one voice is if you're a trustee, talk to the chair. The chair is 
the voice of the board and uh, try not to violate that. Uh, do, do you think there's an easy way to uh, remember the difference between the board chair's role, the board's role, and the president's role? Well, the one easy way to, to remember that is to violate it and get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, that's not the way I recommend, but that's a good, quick way to do it. Uh, you know, open your mouth to the public when you shouldn't have. You'll get, you'll get, uh, you'll learn real fast that that was the wrong thing to do. Um, um, listen, let me, let me give you a, a, a better answer. The what boards do, ours does, but I'm sure every, every board does a form of this. When the new trustee first comes in, there's an orientation that's done. An orientation many times by the president to uh, discuss the college itself. Our president, for instance, walks you all over the campus, asks you, uh, answers any questions that you might want to ask, um, and uh, does a real thorough job. And quite frankly, our president would uh, who we think is a great guy uh, would would give you ten uh, campus talks and walks if you if you need it, but the board itself will give you an orientation also, and part of the orientation is to let you know what the role is of you as a trustee, but what the special role is as the chairperson of the of the trustee, and and everybody needs to know that because in in our board, the tr the chairmanship. Um, uh, rotates every so often and eventually if you stay on a board long enough you'll be the chair yeah so an, another point that you mentioned today uh, also stands out to me um, in line with the, the questions about questioning you recommended that a new trustee ask lots of questions of the board chair and today earlier you were cautioning about putting too much in writing which is really a whole um, that that plays into a separate conversation about ethics overall but for new trustees who are listening um, can you talk a little bit about communication and the importance of being um, conscientious and conscious and aware of what you're putting out yes thanks for asking that I I'm going to answer you as a trustee but I'm also going to answer partially as a lawyer on that because I think um, there are many times when questions like what you just asked require both hats. Um, obviously, we live in a very technological world, and there's no reason to ignore that. The pros are better than the cons when it comes to technology. However, everybody should remember that the minute you touch any keyboard, even if it's a keyboard on your cell phone, what you just dialed could end up in China within seconds, and therefore it could be around the world. So what does that mean? Be very, very, very cautious when you use electronic communication. Now, I, I, I can't and I won't say don't ever use it. That's not reasonable. But be very, very cautious. You know, this may sound old-fashioned, but I still use a cell phone as a phone, <laughs> okay? You know, you can actually talk to people. In fact, sometimes it's not even a bad idea if you turn your phone off and meet with the person in what we used to call in person. It's not a bad idea. Um, and that's how you, that's the best way to communicate. Let me give you an example as to why. If I send an e let's say I send an email to the other members of my board. And the email says something like, hey guys, are you guys, have you guys considered and uh, have you read and researched and considered that resolution we're going to vote on tomorrow? Because quite frankly, I'm going to vote against it because I think it's the biggest piece of garbage I ever saw. Let's say I say that to the other members of my board, which I can say to them personally anytime I want. That's what boards, boards talk. We, we talk, we converse, we help each other and discuss things with each other. That email, when the contractor who doesn't get the resolution voted on positively that that contractor wanted, and that contractor is real hot about that, and that contractor hires a lawyer and decides to sue the school for some reason, the first thing that lawyer is going to do is get a copy of that email. Emails are not private 
automatically. So don't think that they are. They're also not, also, um, I wish people would understand that the word delete doesn't mean delete permanently forever and can never get retrieved because it's not, none of that is true. So, so the, what's the point? The point is, don't say something in an email or a text or obviously a letter. Don't say something like, I'm not going to vote for that resolution because it's the biggest bunch of garbage I ever saw. What you should say is, I'm, by the way, I'm not saying don't have that thought. What you should say is, um, I have some concerns about that resolution. I'd like to talk to you in person about it. You said the exact same thing, and you're going to accomplish the exact same thing, and that email, you can discover it all you want, but it doesn't hurt the school. Mm -hmm. so, so that's an example of what I'm talking about. I'm not saying don't communicate, and I'm definitely not saying don't communicate electronically, but you have to be cautious. You have to start being cautious. You know, when you're a trustee, rather than a, a regular lay person uh, in the community, when you're a tr trustee, you have a fiduciary responsibility to never hurt the school. If you, if you write something that might be hurtful, you may violate your fiduciary duty. What's the answer? Either write nothing or write nothing that will hurt the school. Very, something very uh, superfluous, if you, if you can. And then, and then ha have lunch with the chairman the next day. Hey, Bob, you know, you know what my thoughts are? X, Y, and Z. What do you think? Talk like that. You know, a lawyer can't subpoena that lunch talk. Okay, that's, that's, that's a good thing for the school that might get sued for no reason. So that, that's my advice on uh, being cautious on anything that you write. And by the way, it includes anything, not, a formal, not just a formal letter or my position paper or, 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 or a, um, a report that uh, one of our vice presidents put, puts together. It includes text messages. For instance, so be, what, what, what's the what's the message I'm trying to convey? Be very careful. Be concerned. Make yourself known in a, in a in a more personal way. Now, in a similar vein, sometimes misunderstandings might arise between board members. What do you think is the best way to to tackle those? Here's the easy answer, but I still think it's the best answer. Just talk, talk, talk. Mm -hmm. um, um, I'm remembering that in my 16 plus years, there have been times when I've been misunderstood, and it bothers me. So what what would happen is, I would try hard to re-explain something at least, so that even if somebody disagrees with me, which that happens and that's okay, at least they understand what I'm talking about, and it, they don't they don't disagree with me for a a, 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 a bad reason. By the way, the alternative is also true. I, want, I don't want to misunderstand somebody else. I could, I could end up voting for something the wrong way because I misunderstood something. So, so, so you know, um, ask a lot of questions. Bring, you know, there, there are times in your board meeting when you're supposed to talk, yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, you know, try to be conscientious, try to be relatively quiet, succinct, don't, don't, don't talk forever and be a big mouth. But once in a while, you know, you're, you're there not to be a, 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 a vegetable. You're there to talk as a person and, 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 and get information and give information and make the right decision. So, so um, you might even say, you know, I, I, I'm smiling because uh, your listeners ought to know that I'm smiling right now. Uh, I'm smiling right now because there have been times when I was misunderstood and I might even come right out and say, listen, everybody, I don't want you to misunderstand me. You know, <laughs> X, X, Y, and Z is what I meant, okay? You got to do that. You got to do that. When you first started serving on, a, on the board, um, what did you think was most surprising or most unexpected? I was wondering when are there going to be major conflicts that this board is going to argue and fight and yell about? Mm -hmm. That literally, that's what I said to myself for the first couple of years. Our board, I'm sure this is the majority of the boards, our board functions very well. It's a, it's, it's, it's a conscientious board. We don't have major arguments all the time. Um, and um, we also try to stay away from politics, by the way, which is probably a good idea. Uh, but um, I remember saying to myself, to myself, when are we going to start fighting about some major issue? Because, because, because there were no fights about major issues. What we did was, if a major issue came up in front of the school uh, for us to deal with, we, would, we, we, we really did think about it, talk about it, converse, have back and forth conversations about it. And, and, and I don't remember ever having uh, anybody ever really raising their voice in a negative way. Uh, if anything, 
we raised our voice in a positive way, which is really nice. Uh, so I'm specifically to answer your question, I, I remember that 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 was my um, my overriding thought when I was well, first a trustee. I kind of felt that wait a minute, if there's no big major controversies here and and and, and ultimately uh, yelling matches. What are we really you know? What, are, are, are we just rubber stamping everything? And 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 that's not true that you're just rubber stamping everything. But that's what it se- seemed like yeah. almost. You know, like like um, I don't even have to be here, kind of. You know. Mm-hmm. Uh, so th- that happened, and that that's a good thing. I'll tell you one issue that did pop up. We had a major issue, eventually, having to do with um, to what degree, you, you know, if you in, in our in our state, in our county, um, the fees for tuition for someone who lives in our county are a little bit lower than the fee for somebody who wants to come to our school from out of county. And that fee is even lower than someone who might be from out of state who wants to come to our school from out of state even, let alone out of county. You know, now with the Internet, you know, we and, of course, many, many other schools, we have international students in our in our county college. Yeah. So, so the issue came up about... Um, the difference in different tuition rates for different res- types of residents, and overlapping that was the issue. Is what w- the issue was? What do you do if the potential uh, student that you want to be in your school is someone who is uh, still an immigrant that is not uh, a citizen yet? What do you do at that point? Do you even let that person be a student? And if so, at what rate? So we had a major debate on the rate to charge um, undocumented immigrants. Let's put it that way. And uh, what I, I remember, even then we didn't fight, by the way. B- but boy, did we disagree. <laughs> but we didn't fight. But I remember that, you know, normally not too many members of the public come to our board meetings, but everybody's welcome. That board meeting that we discussed that issue, we had to hold it in our gymnasium, and we had hundreds of people came to listen to our trustee board meeting, <laughs> you know, the board meeting that we probably averaged maybe a half a dozen people a, a month. So um, that was kind of interesting. But the point is that we didn't even yell at each other at that time, mm-hmm. okay? We talked kind of, you know, might have even gotten a little stern, um, and we uh, we did disagree. But um, you still maintain your decorum and, and, and um, be as professional as you can. I would imagine as a brand new trustee that might feel somewhat alienating <laughs> to be surrounded by hundreds of people in a gymnasium. Uh, to be honest with you, y- y- yes, but usually even new trustees, quite frankly, they're 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 I mean this in a nice way. They're they're big boys and girls. Sure. You know? They're 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 people from the community usually who um have been around a little bit, have experience, you know, maybe been on other boards. Uh, uh, businessmen, businesswomen, uh, people from all walks of life. And quite frankly, to be honest with you, uh, they um, y- your skin's a little bit thick when you first get there. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it gets thicker. Mm-hmm. But uh, uh, you gotta be, you got to be tough enough, uh, it's, you know, small t tough enough, to be able to deal with tough issues sometimes. And, and, and I've never found somebody... Uh, you know, in essence, too weak to deal with it, to be honest with you. Well, that, for me, leads to the question, too, of what, what to you is most rewarding about doing this? Why, why are you motivated? Easy answer. I try to go to as many um, functions as I can on campus. You know, being a trustee doesn't just mean reading reports, going to committee meetings, and then go to the full board meeting and vote in resolutions. I mean, that's, that's, the base, that's the base for how to be a trustee. You also should um, go to events in the community, go to events in college, speak at different places and things like that as much as you can. And every single time I go to a school function, meaning my own school function, uh, it's rewarding because you, you actually see, um, I, guess if, I, said, I guess since this is over the air, Instead of a, a, a TV monitor, you ought to have a, a violin playing in the background. But, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but you actually see the students that you're making decisions about, and it's really rewarding to to to, to see to see them. You know, maybe some student just uh, did something so significant that 
uh, he or she won an award. You know, well, you feel like you did, you helped you helped that that kid, um, uh, a, a kid who, whose family doesn't have enough money to to pay our tuition, but but thanks to the trustee board, we started a, a new scholarship that now this person can can get their degree. I mean, there's nothing more rewarding than that. So to answer your question, to actually go to student functions on campus and see what's going on, and that that's the reward. Thanks for listening to this episode of In the Know. Remember to subscribe so you're notified when we release new episodes. We'll see you next week.